In this video, we're going to learn about how a nerve impulse crosses a synapse. So let's take a look at a, a couple of neurons here. Let's say we've got uh, oh, neuron A, we'll call this. All right, so here we've got neuron and then here we've got neuron B. And finally, we're going to end this at, we're drawing here, but there's a muscle fiber. All right, so the point is to take a nerve impulse from this point perceived by neuron A, to have it travel through neuron A, then it has to cross the gap or the synapse to neuron B, then it has to travel through neuron B, and then it has to cross the gap here and cause that muscle fiber to contract. So, we would call this synapse. This is the gap between two neurons. And down here, we'll call this one a neuromuscular junction, which is essentially the same thing as a synapse, except it's a gap between the nerve endings of neuron B and the muscle fiber. Now, a couple other things we should label here. Um, neuron A. If the impulse, let's say the impulse is at this point traveling through A, so it's reached here, uh, but has not yet reached the synapse, we would refer to this as the presynaptic neuron, which would make the, the postsynaptic neuron. Pre means before the impulse has reached the synapse, so all the way up to where it reaches down to this area right here until it crosses that synapse. So the one on the other side of the synapse would be the postsynaptic neuron. So we're looking at the presynaptic to postsynaptic neuron. Now it's important to note that once the impulse crosses that synapse and reaches here and then travels down the next neuron and ends up down here, well then this one becomes the presynaptic neuron and this becomes the postsynaptic muscle fiber. So presynaptic and postsynaptic are all relative to where the impulse is at any given point. Now, what we're going to be looking at are the events that occur right in this region right here, between the axon terminal of one neuron and the dendrite of the next. That's the synapse. Now, you should note that it's exactly the same process what goes on from here crossing the neuromuscular junction. It'll be the same process. Uh, we're going to look at the activity of one particular substance that crosses that synapse. Um, so let's take a look at an a, a enlargement of this region right here. We're just going to enlarge that and make that bigger. All right, so here we have. Here we have a presynaptic neuron. And we have the axon terminal of that presynaptic neuron, axon terminal right there. And then here we have the postsynaptic neuron. This would be the dendrite of the next neuron, or it could be the muscle fiber if this is a neuromuscular junction. And the space between the two we refer to as the synaptic cleft. So this whole thing, this presynaptic neuron, the synaptic cleft, and the postsynaptic neuron, all of that together would be called the synapse. All right, so what happens here is our nerve impulse is traveling along and it's going in this direction. Okay, it's coming here in this diagram and it's crossing over this way. So it's coming down to the end and what it's doing is it's opening sodium channels and allowing sodium to enter the neuron all the way down the neuron. Okay, here's our impulse here and it's allowing the sodium and it's opening the sodium channels to allow that sodium to come in all the way down until it reaches the last of those channels. And when it reaches the last of those channels, well, it can't go any further. So I'm assuming this would be the last of the channels. Now, they could be calcium channels. We're not going to get into the details there. Let's just assume that it's sodium channels opening. We get to the last one. The sodium comes in. Well, technically, it's calcium. But for biology theory purposes, it's the last area where depolarization occurs. So. What happens then is synaptic vesicles. Synaptic vesicles are little sacs filled with neurotransmitter substance. Those synaptic vesicles are going to start to move towards the 
end of the axon terminal. They're just going to move towards there uh, as a result of that depolarization. And inside of those vesicles, we have neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter we're going to be referring to here today is called acetylcholine. Better spell that right. Now, acetylcholine happens to be an excitatory neurotransmitter, which means it will allow the impulse to cross the gap and end up on the other side. Now, it's not the neurotransmitter that crosses the gap, it's the depolarization that crosses the gap. So what happens here is the neurotransmitter vesicles, let's just take this vesicle right here, it fuses with the membrane and spills the neurotransmitter substance, the acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft. Since there is a higher concentration on the presynaptic side than on the postsynaptic side, there will be a net diffusion of neurotransmitter across the synaptic cleft. Then, over on the other side, there will be these ligand-gated channels, or just we'll just call them channels, with receptors for the neurotransmitter. So here's a channel right here, and when the neurotransmitter encounters that receptor, that receptor opens up a sodium channel, and then sodium can rush in here. So sodium can cross into this cell, and if enough of those channels open and enough sodium comes in, then we will get, we'll reach the threshold of this neuron, and we'll get a depolarization, and the nerve impulse will now be over here, and we'll have successfully crossed the gap. So that's how a nerve impulse works. It travels from the presynaptic neuron, triggers the vesicles to migrate, to move towards the uh, axon terminal, spills the neurotransmitter substance, the acetylcholine, into the synaptic cleft, which then crosses the gap, opens up the sodium channels, and off the impulse goes. However, that's not the end of the story. Because once that sodium has gone across the gap and set that impulse, well, those channels, those ligand-gated channels that opened up, these things right here, well, they have to close again in order for this neuron to repolarize so that it can do this all over again. Also, the acetylcholine has to be replenished back into these vesicles so that uh, another impulse can be sent across if another one comes along in a, a few milliseconds from now. So, uh, what has to happen here is we have to destroy that acetylcholine. So there's a second set of vesicles, I'll just draw them in a different color here, a second set of vesicles in behind that are going to follow the first set. And that second set of vesicles are also going to migrate and fuse but they don't contain a neurotransmitter, they contain an enzyme. We'll just highlight it here. And the enzyme they contain, in this case, is called choline esterase. Now, the fact that it ends in ASE tells us that it's an enzyme, and choline esterase is a specific enzyme that is able to break down acetylcholine into its component parts. So it breaks it down which means once these vesicles migrate and fuse, then the enzyme will end up in the synapse, and that enzyme will encounter the acetylcholine and break it into pieces. And the pieces get reabsorbed back up into the uh, presynaptic axon terminal, and when they get reabsorbed, they get reassembled into acetylcholine so that a new vesicle can be made and this whole thing can happen all over again. Uh, it will also destroy the um, acetylcholine that is attached itself to the channels, and those channels will be able to close. So that will close the channels and allow this postsynaptic neuron to repolarize. It will also allow the neurotransmitter substance to get reassembled and replenished in, in the axon terminal so that this can happen over and over and over again. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of exam questions that would have something to do with this. All right, so here's an example of dealing with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it says, people with Alzheimer's disease have a lower than normal level of acetylcholine. Well, there's something we've heard of, acetylcholine, right? That's the neurotransmitter substance. So the lower amount means fewer nerve impulses are going to cross that synapse. Cholinesterase inhibitors, such as the drug, I don't even know how to pronounce that. I don't even care how to pronounce it. I just know it's a drug. It's a drug that can slow development of symptoms in early to middle stages of Alzheimer's disease that cannot stop the progression of the disease. The, again, just drug molecule, let's not worry about pronouncing the names of drug 
company things, it, it doesn't matter. The drug molecule has a shape that allows it to attach to the active site of choline esterase. There's something you've heard of, choline esterase. So here we've got a little diagram of this. So the question's asking us, in the diagram above, the drug, the drug and acetylcholine are numbered respectively. Now respectively means in order. So that means we need the drug first and the acetylcholine second. I'm going to identify the acetylcholine though because I think that one's going to be easier to find because here we have the vesicles. Inside the vesicles we have these little triangles. We can see the vesicle fusing with the membrane here. So here we've got our presynaptic neuron. Here we've got our post either synaptic neuron or it could be a, a muscle fiber, we don't know. This could be a neuromuscular junction. But anyway, we've got these little black triangles. So these little back black triangles are clearly crossing the synapse, and we can see over here there are receptors for those little black triangles, which means, to me, those little black triangles certainly look like they would be the acetylcholine. So we are looking for, in this case, number three to be our second item, because we need the drug first and the acetylcholine second. So that allows us to zero in on answers A and C. So now we need to know, well, what is the, the drug? Well, the drug is an inhibitor of cholinesterase. That means it says it has a shape that allows it to attach to the active site of cholinesterase. Well, what I can see here is this little gray rectangular thing, square thing with the indent in it, seems to be attaching to the acetylcholine. So that would give an indication that that would be an enzyme that possibly could break down acetylcholine. But here I can see the same structure attaching to these white triangles. The white triangles appear to be filling the active site of that enzyme, if number one is an enzyme. Uh, and that means that the black triangles can't, if the white triangle is doing that. So the white triangle seems to be inhibiting that enzyme. So it's the white triangle, or number two, that's going to be the drug. So in this case, our answer is C. All right, there is a follow-up question to this one. So let's take a look at the follow-up. All right, the follow-up says, which of the following statements describes the effect of the drug? On synaptic transmission. So what is the effect of this drug? So again, wherever I see this name, I'm just going to write the drug. And I know this seems unnecessary for some of you, but whenever we have names of medications, names of diseases, things like that in exam questions, it just complicates the reading level, just makes the reading comprehension a little more complicated. So let's just simplify. So the drug breaks down acetylcholine. Well, is the drug breaking down the acetylcholine? No, the enzyme cholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine. It's not the drug that's doing that. The drug is preventing that from happening. So we're not going to go with A. Part B, it says the drug replaces cholinesterase so that more acetylcholine is present in the synapse. Um, there certainly would be more acetylcholine present in the synapse, but is it replacing the cholinesterase or is it interfering with the cholinesterase? Well, that, that word replaces makes me a little nervous about this. So let's see what the rest of our answers say. Uh, we've got the drug blocks the release of acetylcholine. Well, the acetylcholine seemed to be released fine. In the diagram, we could see it being released into the synapse, so I'm not seeing that happening, so we can't have that. And D, it says the drug prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine so that more acetylcholine is present in the synapse. Now, we are here, the only difference between these answers is are we preventing the breakdown of acetylcholine or is it replacing it as uh, cholinesterase? Well, the cholinesterase is still in the synapse, so I, I would say it's not replacing the cholinesterase. So the, the better answer here is the drug prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine because it's attaching to the enzyme cholinesterase, and by attaching to that enzyme, enzyme acetylcholine can't, so that's a, a competitively inhibited enzyme, and that would cause acetylcholine to be to, to have a higher concentration of synapse. So answer D is the answer that we go with on this one.